Yeah, the exam is coming up next Monday. Is that a better time than after Thanksgiving? Probably. <laughs> no. <laughs> we don't have enough of a sample size. <laughs> Probably. You prefer to get done with it. The reason we are having it early is so that you can focus on your projects afterwards. We, we thought about putting it after Thanksgiving, which is the last week of classes, basically. But it's better to uh, better that you focus on your projects during that time. So we'll have it Monday. And you've already taken one midterm. It's going to be similar in terms of the type of questions uh, that you will get. And we've linked some of the old 740 exams and some old 447 exams. Uh, I'd encourage you to go through those exams, actually, even before the review session for uh, Friday. And you can ask questions during the review session. Certainly go through the lecture notes, but also go through some of these old exams. Some of the questions uh, from uh, some of the topics that we've covered uh, uh, are also covered in, uh, in the old 740 exams as well as old 447 exams. And there are a lot of interesting questions in there. Okay. So that's the exam. Uh, oh, what time is the exam? That's right. So 7.30. Is that too late for people? That's the official scheduled time. That's the time everybody's available. It's going to be one hour, 20 minutes again. Uh, so it's not going to be a long exam. It's going to be here, yes. Uh, where, uh, so we had only one 7.30 session this semester, uh, and 7.30 PM session this semester. I guess we didn't have an AM session. That's, which one's worse, AM or PM? <laughs> there you go, good. <laughs> That's why it's scheduled at 7.30 PM. <laughs> I agree, by, by the way, with that. But, um, but we had that uh, guest lecture here by Yan Jing, Dr. Yan Jing Li, right? So it's, it's going to be here. And what else? Somebody had a question, I think, online? Uh, yeah, the exam times are on both screens. OK, we'll, we'll contact them. Basically, it'll be around that time frame. You can, you can tell, tell them. Any other questions on the exam? So we'll have a review session uh, during the regular recitation session on Friday. That's why I'm going to keep the session short. But I definitely encourage everyone to prepare for the review session so that you can ask questions. Uh, in terms of the contents of the exam, uh, basically everything is fair game. We've covered lots of things. Hopefully you've learned a lot of things about, uh, a lot of advanced things about computer architecture. Uh, and everything will be fair game, but it's very likely that we're going to focus more on uh, the second part that was not covered by the first exam. Well, second part actually starts from here, right? Including the guest lecture. We didn't have questions on the guest lecture, so you can go back and look at that. So all of these topics, you can take a look and ask questions. And we've covered, during the last recitation last week, some of the topics, right? Some of you were here. Actually, many of you were here. Uh, OK. Any other questions? OK, hopefully you'll have some uh, on Friday. <laughs> Looks like whatever you write comes up over there, too, <laughs> or whatever someone writes. <laughs> I don't have control on my computer anymore. <laughs> OK. So, OK, that's the exam. The other thing I want to discuss. Uh, is projects. How is everyone doing on projects? Hopefully good. That's a, a reminder, that's one of the most important parts of the course. Actually, that's the single most important part of the course, right? Exams are only so important. But projects, this is the, that's the main fo one of the major focuses of the course. So please focus on that. Definitely after the exam, uh, you'll have two, let's see, let me see the project timeline. Uh, yeah, there you go. We'll have a project poster session on Friday, December 13th. So that's be, that'll be where you actually present your final results, pretty much. And we'll give you feedback. And the final report will be due December 15th. So you'll, be, you'll have two days to incorporate the feedback. Okay. 
So poster session will be during the final exam time, which I believe is, what time? 5.30 to 7? 5.30 to 8.30. 5.30 to 8.30. And it'll be, uh, I think, uh, at, at Wien Hall, 5409 and 5403, those classrooms. So we're going to organize as a, as, a, as a poster session room during that time. So hopefully it should be fun. You should go around and see other projects too. But definitely focus on your projects really hard in the next, next two weeks. Uh, and if you have any questions, definitely talk with me and the TAs. Make sure you schedule appointments. OK, anything else on the poster session? I guess there's, yeah, well, of course, final report. Well, I think we have a project website. I don't know if you have looked at it, but this is the time to look at it now, if you have not. That's the milestone. Yeah, this is the report. Actually, we should have instructions on the poster as well. Uh, but posters will be similar to the report, basically. You could actually organize your poster such that it looks like the report. Not a lot of text. It's going to be slides. <laughs> don't, don't put the pages of your report on your poster, obviously. <laughs> but the, in spirit, you can organize it that way. And that way, you can get feedback on your report also during your poster. But basically, we'll expect you to present the poster, uh, explain what you've done, ex explain especially uh, what mechanisms have you devised and uh, ev evaluated. What are your major takeaways from your results? Why do they make sense? Or do they make sense? Hopefully, they make sense. <laughs> uh, okay, and this is uh, the project report instructions are here. And as I said at the beginning of the semester, the goal is to write. Uh, almost publication quality report. So strive for that. And there, there have been many uh, reports that have turned into publications later on. The Atlas memory scheduler paper that you looked at, for example, threat cluster memory scheduler. Uh, Raider paper was one of them. But I'm hoping there will be more from you. OK. I guess that's all I have on the projects. Any questions? Concerns, thoughts. No, everybody's excited to finish a good project. You can take a look at the milestone. Oh, that's a, that's the other thing I want to talk about. Well, we discussed this before, but you can take a look at the milestone sessions if you want to see the other projects also, or if you want to remember the feedback that I gave. But there's a good variety, healthy variety of projects that are happening. Okay. Nothing else on the projects? OK, let me go back to the schedule then. As I said, I, I don't want this to be a long session, but I want to remind you of what we have covered in the last week and what we're covering this week. So we've covered pretty much everything about multi-threading, uh, actually most important things about multi-threading uh, during the last two lectures. Uh, and before that, we've talked about VLIWN uh, decoupled access and execute. But we've discussed this a little bit uh, in the past uh, recitation session. And this week, we're going to cover out of order execution. So if you've taken 447, this, is not, this won't be that much new to you, except for the papers that you're going to read. Uh, so even if you've taken 447, we'd like to definitely uh, brush up that material. Uh, Thomas Law's algorithm, for example, uh, memory dependence handling. You guys remember different approaches to doing that? a lot of fun, right? Yeah. And, and uh, this Friday, uh, the last lecture before the exam, which will be included on the exam again, is the static instruction scheduling lecture. Again, if you've taken 447, the lecture is the same. But the readings uh, are new. So maybe we can go over the readings very briefly. Yeah, this is the reading that uh, you're supposed to do or out of order execution. And these are the other readings. Yeah, Alpha 21264 microprocessor paper. That's actually a very good paper that discusses different design decisions that were made in the Alpha 21264 microprocessor. This was one of the fastest. Actually, it was the fastest microprocessor of its time in 1990, circa 1997. It was 500 megahertz. It was faster than other designs, Intel designs. And it was designed to be that way. And the paper discusses many 
uh, it, it was an out of order execution processor. It was four white. Uh, it had a large instruction window for its time. It has AD entry instruction window. And it had a clustered microarchitecture. So it had two execution clusters. Uh, two instructions were executed in one cluster and two instructions were executed in the other cluster. And they replicated the register file uh, between the two clusters. Right? Do you remember why? We've discussed this actually very, very early on in this course. Like what's the reason for clustering a microarchitecture? No? You get a more scalable instruction window, right? But there, there was a particular reason why they replicated the uh, register files. So you can have a monolithic register file. That's 80 entries, let's say. Or you can have two register files. Accessing is faster. Why? Smaller number of registers in each? In what sense? Maybe you're getting into some getting to something, but I'd like you to be precise. Some logic is less, you're right. But there's a particular reason for it. Is it because you have fewer registers in each cluster? That was not true in that design, actually. If you statically partition the registers across different clusters, then that would be true. Yes? In the register file? Oh, I think you're, you're talking in general about clustering. That's true for in, in general about clustering. So if you cluster the instruction window, then you're searching fewer entries because uh, actually, you're, you're, maybe you're searching more entries, but it's, they're distributed. They're not a monolithic uh, instruction window, monolithic scheduler. So that would be faster. But I was talk, uh, asking the register file. Yes? You also have a shorter path to the registry file. Then. I mean, instead mm -hmm. of having a monolithic mm -hmm. register, then you have two really I guess that's, uh, yeah, the, the path to the execution unit, the bypass path. Uh, and the, for, uh, the connection, interconnect, will be shorter. That's right. That's one of the reasons, actually, to cluster. Let me see. Basically, inst I don't know if this, OK. I did remember it this time. Let's see how we're going to do this. So this is your register file. I think it was 80 entries, but I'm not sure. We can look at it. It doesn't matter. Uh, and instead of having this feed, I guess this was not a good choice to place. Maybe I'll put the, I'll put the execution units here. You have four execution units. And your results are basically going to these different execution units somehow. Uh, what they did instead was to have the same register file, maybe 80 entries here. And 80 entries here, and have this feed two execution units. Right. That's the idea. And it's true that the interconnect is nicer here, but there's a bigger thing. Fewer ports. Fewer ports. Yes, that, that was exactly the reason, actually. Here, you want to build a four wide machine, right? Which means that you need to. Uh, access the register file, let's assume that your instructions have two operands. You need to have eight ports into the register file. If it's a monolithic register file, you do need to have eight ports, right? And get eight values. Whereas here, if you actually clustered it, now what you've done is this cluster, this register file actually serves only two execution units, which means that you need two by two, four ports, right? Read ports and four read ports here also. Now this register file is much faster because it's four ported versus eight ported. Make sense? It's also more energy efficient as well. I don't know how to get this oriented right. Okay? So that's the idea of 
clustering. And these register files are replicated, actually. They're the same registers over here. So in that case, what happens? What, what happens if you do a write to one register file in one cluster? You need to write to the other register file also, right? That's, what the, that's the design decision. Actually, you don't have to write it until you really need that value. But in Alpha 21264, the design decision was when, when this, let's say this, this adder over here is writing to register 5, physical register 5, it not only writes to physical register 5 over here, but it also has a path that writes to physical register 5 over here, which means that you're not really saving write ports. Right? And what they did was they actually had one cycle delay from this cluster to this cluster. So uh, after the add executed, it wrote to the register file. And one cycle after that, the result appeared in this register file. Why? Because they've clustered the machine and they've optimized the clusters. So inter-cluster communication now takes longer. That's usually a common issue in clustered microarchitectures like this. You're optimizing for that cluster, but when you need to communicate values between the different clusters, it takes longer. Make sense? So it was actually exactly the number of ports that led to this design decision because what they, they wanted to design a 500 megahertz machine and they figured out with, that, with an eight ported register file there was no way they were going to have one cycle register file access uh, with 500 megahertz. So they, instead of increasing the register file access latency to two cycles, they decided they would cluster the machine, keep the register file one, one cycle access within 500 megahertz and hopefully tolerate that one cycle intercluster communication latency when that happens. Yes? So what is it that makes the ports so expensive for the register file? Are the registers just like memory? And then it's like That's right, exactly. It's, it's just like any memory, right, SRAM. If you want to, right. uh, if you want to read more things at the same time, you need to have decoders for different ports, right? So you need uh, any, every, every port introduces a new decoder. And if you actually, tr uh, there, there are multiple ways of doing this, right? We've discussed this and actually let me point you to that. <laughs> uh, you could bank the register file, right? Uh, th basically, we want to enable multiple accesses in parallel to the register file. In this case, we want to enable four accesses in parallel because we want to be able to read four registers at the same time. Uh, how, the, the key question is, how do you do that over here? Uh, and let me actually go to that, and we'll briefly cover that. But I have to go to the 447 website for this. That's the easiest way I do things. Where is that? No. Where do you think we have it? Oh well. It's in one of these lectures, huh? If I don't find it, I'll just explain it. <laughs> yes, there you go. Enabling multiple axes in parallel. Ah. Oh. Guess we didn't get to it. Do you guys remember this? Or OK, enabling high bandwidth caches. Actually, it's really high bandwidth memories in general, if you remember from 447 last semester. So how do you design? Uh, uh, the key is we want to support multiple instructions per cycle. right? And those need data. Those instructions need data from the register file or cache. 
uh, how do you design a memory that handles multiple instructions per cycle? And there are multiple ways of doing this, right? And all of these increase cost. In the register file, you can have uh, two multiporting, right? Which means that every, uh, if you look at this, this is one example of true multiporting. You have a register file cell, and you have two ports that can access it at the same time. And this could happen, right? If you if we go back to this figure, uh, I don't know where that went. Okay. Something is odd here, but that's okay. If you look at this figure, this uh, some instructions may require R2, right? Actually, all instructions that are being executed at the same time may want R2, right? Let's say you have a bunch of ads that just do this, four of them. That means you would like eight copies of R2 at the same time. How do you support that? Well, one way of doing it is actually truly multiporting the cell such that you can have eight independent accesses to it at the same time. What does that mean? That means that you have eight d different decoders that can access the cell. And this is, what, this is an example with two different decoders accessing that cell. Right? Does that make sense? Yeah. So this is two multiporting, and this is very, very expensive, obviously, both in terms of area and in terms of latency, because any port you add is basically increasing the capacitance right, of, of, these, uh, of, these inter of this interconnect over here. So it'll just take much longer. People actually design. Uh, these large multi-ported caches and de designing them in an energy efficient way is a, is a difficult challenge. So that's why, this is why uh, adding more ports to a cache actually increases the latency significantly. I mean, there are other ways of handling it. I will not necessarily cover them over here, but th remember we've covered virtual multi-porting. This was actually a cute idea that was employed in Alpha 21264, which you will read uh, in that paper. The idea is instead of having multiple ports, timeshare port. Right. At the beginning of the cycle, access it with uh, like uh, access it to get R2 at the end. Of, oh, yeah, I need to switch. I guess that's okay. It's not it's not important. At the beginning of the cycle, access it uh, with uh, one address. At the end of the cycle, access it with two ad two ad uh, with the second address. Right. That way, you can sustain two accesses per cycle, except you time multiplex them. So you time multiplex. Uh, if you look at your cycle, assuming your cycle, time, uh, cycle is long enough, <laughs> uh, let's, let's say this is your clock, right? This is not a very even clock, but assume that it's an even clock. Maybe at the high edge of the clock, you do one access. At the low edge, you do the second access, right? And you can do that. You, you, you need to design your cache to operate that way, obviously. But this is called virtual multiporting. And you could actually have even more, like you could do four accesses per cycle by having sh phase shifted clocks and designing your cache that way. It becomes co more complicated. But this way, you can eliminate the need for multiple clock, uh, multiple ports. With one port, you're utilizing one port at different times. So you can have perhaps another clock that looks like this, right? You need to have another port, of course, that's controlled by this clock, right? Yes. Anyway, we can go into <laughs> detail. But think, think about it. You can actually uh, increase the number of accesses if you, can, if you can start and end access in the middle. Right? OK? Alpha did this. Uh, so if you, if you go back to these slides, yeah, I'll, I'll skip two multiporting, but virtual multiporting. Basically, each access in this case needs to be significantly shorter than a clock cycle. And this is used in alpha 21 to 64. The paper you read actually should describe this. The problem is this is not scalable, right? If you, if you want to have like 16 accesses in a given cycle, each access needs to take one, one sixteenth of the time. Of a cycle. 
So you could potentially design a reg register file this way, but that's, it's very difficult to do, a multi-port register file. You could have multiple register file copies, which is actually different from clustering in this case, right? <laughs> Clustering is also multiple register file copies, but they're really logical copies. Each of these clustered, oh, I guess I should switch here. To design an eight-ported register file, you can actually have, well, this is not nice, I guess. I shouldn't do that. Let me go over here. Instead of having true eight-ported register file, you have two copies, exact the same copies, and each of them is four ports. Right? Now it's kind of looking like the clustering that we've, uh, we've looked at. The difference is clustering actually is, a, at a, is, a, is at a machine level concept, right? You're, you're looking at the entire pipeline. Your entire pipeline is clustered after some point. Here we're just, you could argue that you're clustering the, within the register file, right? So in this case, uh, each of these is four ports, so you get an eight-ported register file. In this case, I show you, I guess, uh, how to get two ports, and you have two copies of the memory, and you have two ports. Uh, the problem here is uh, what we have looked at earlier, store operations. You need to basically, uh, whenever you write, you need to write to both copies, right, to, to uh, ensure consistency. In this case, the other problem is the area, right? If you want to add eight ports, you need to have eight copies. And that's a lot of area. Okay? And the last solution is banking, which I will not cover. So you know banking very well by now, basically. You partition the address space within the register file, so you can have many banks. And you know the problem over there is the bank conflicts now. So it's difficult to... Uh, especially a register file uh, like this. If you have bank conflict, you need to somehow schedule the instructions such that uh, you handle those bank conflicts. Okay. So I believe what alpha designers did uh, was they had a four, true four-ported four register file. I'm not absolutely sure, but I believe they had a true four-ported register file here, and they replicated it across different clusters. And that way they were able to satisfy their cycle time requirements. Any questions? Yes. Oh, in terms of area. So I'm not sure, actually. Yeah. Uh, in terms of area, probably this is larger. That's my guess. But then this has other benefits, right? Because it's uh, now your intercluster communication bypasses can be fewer. So you don't you don't have uh, so what they uh, if you're uh, if you're looking if you're comparing the clustered organization, I call this the clustered organization. And this is the monolithic organization, right? Uh, if you just look at the register file area, maybe this is larger. I'm not sure, because this has eight ports, right? That register file has eight ports, and that could be a lot of area uh, to, get the to get good performance. Uh, but here, you get additional benefits from clustering. Uh, bypass is full within a cluster, meaning if you generate a result from this execution unit, you can bypass it to this execution unit right away. Whereas that doesn't happen across clusters. Right? Whereas over there, it's usually a better idea to have a full bypass across all of the execution units. Otherwise, you'll need to, you're, you need to modify your scheduler that way. Right? To take that into account. And if you look over here, the scheduler is, can be clustered as well. Right? You have Scheduler 1 and Scheduler 2, or 0 and 1. So this, uh, overall area, this, this may be lower. But again, I don't know the alpha design. It's not, it's, it's not clear. 
you can make choices that can make the area smaller over there too. Make sense? Oh, here, I see. Yeah. Uh, that needs to connect exists over there too, to different ports. I guess what you're saying is here you have only four write ports, here you have four plus four uh, write ports. Uh, yes, yeah, the red That's right, yes. So actually, you could reduce the write ports here also with some buffering. In the worst case, you'll have four, four writes coming, right? Well, you could, you could reduce the write ports here, make it two by two. That could be dangerous, of course. You'll have you lead to stalls, right? If, if, if all of your writes are happening to, uh, if, if your instruction mix is such that you're always getting writes, then you'll lead to a lot of stalls because part of your register file has two ports, right? That may not be a good idea. Actually, each of your register files has two ports. That's not a good idea, you're saying? OK. <laughs> That's right. But you're right. If, if, if both of them have four ports, then there's more interconnect to those ports. But what they did was basically uh, not have that full connectivity. That full connectivity is enabled after a cycle. So there is some buffering that they've added. And I don't actually remember the, how many write ports they have in that design. Anybody read the paper recently? No? OK. Maybe it's not even in that paper. It may be in, in an alpha hardware reference manual. But these are, the, these are general trade-offs between a monolithic and clustered design. You can reduce the bypass complexity. You can reduce the register file port complexity. You can reduce the scheduler complexity. But the downside is whenever you need to communicate between clusters, it takes a while. If an instruction is scheduled here that's reading R2, that's produced by R2, an instruction that's writing to R2 here, then it takes a while to do that communication. And there are many options to it. You don't have to write every single instance of a register that's produced over here. One option that other people have proposed, for example, when you get a register here, have a bitmap of which registers are actually valid in this uh, register file. How can you do that? Well, before you schedule, let me construct some things here for you. So this is your scheduler. But even before that, there must be something that steers instructions to scheduler, right? So this is your front end iCache, let's say. I don't know if you see that. OK, good. You fetch instructions, you decode them, you rename them, and then there's some logic to steer. This is called the steering logic. So this steering logic knows exactly which instructions are going to scheduler 0 and scheduler 1, or cluster 0 and cluster 1. So at this steering logic, you can keep track of which registers are actually valid in each cluster. Right? The steering logic knows, for example, uh, instruction. Let's say, let's say we have an add over here, writing to R2. The if, uh, if the register file is partitioned, for example, or if the uh, writes are not communicated between the clusters, the st steering logic can say the latest copy of R2 is actually in cluster 1, right? So for each register, you can have where is the latest copy. And Later on, let's say uh, you fetch an instruction multiply that reads from R2 and that writes to some other location. I'm making a mess here, but I guess that's the best I can do with this space for now. <laughs> you fetch this instruction multiply that reads from R2. The steering logic looks up this map, says, oh, R2 is actually going to be produced in cluster 1. Let me steer that instruction to that cluster 1. So it's, it could make a steering decision based on dependence. It's called dependence-based steering. 
And actually, uh, I have assigned a paper that you will read uh, after, um, after the exam, unfortunately, <laughs> that uh, introduces this concept. This is INISCA 1997. Paula Charla et al. Complexity effective superscalar processors. You can look at that. Basically, uh, the steering logic can steer instructions based on where their parents have gone. Right? And that might make sense, right? Because that way you're minimizing the communication latency. But let's assume that this cluster is full for some reason. The steering logic cannot assign this multiply to this cluster. It says, I'm going to send this multiply to this other cluster over here. Right. Well, the hope is that uh, if, if, the, if, if this add instruction, when it produces R2, it's going to write to this cluster. But if you didn't de design the machine that way, you say, whenever uh, an instruction writes to a register, that register will remain in this cluster. Then the steering logic needs to do something else. Basically, the steering logic, before it sends this multiply instruction to uh, to cluster 0, it can actually inject a copy instruction. Right? This is basic, I don't know if you can see that. Let's see. Basically, the function of the copy instruction is to take the R2 that's produced here and copy it to the register file that's here. This is not part of the ISA instructions that architecture. It's injected dynamically to handle inter-cluster data movement. This is one proposal. So basically, copy R2 from cluster 1 into R2 in cluster 0. It's a micro operation, basically. Once that's injected, the copy instruction executes first in cluster 0, and multiply instruction executes next. That's another way of ensuring that intercluster data dependencies are handled correctly. This way, Whenever you produce a value in one cluster, you don't need to write it to the other cluster. The cluster gets that value only when it's really needed in that cluster. And that happens through the injection of these copy instructions. Say it again. Copy, well, uh, what do you mean by critical path? That's right. You do have an additional instruction. And that's the cost of clustering. Clustering buys you additional performance because you can now execute faster. And you can execute, uh, your latencies are lower within the cluster. But whenever you need to communicate across clusters, you have these additional overhead, overheads. Well, that's uh, how would you do that? Yeah. So if you can look ahead, sure. If you can look ahead, well, but then what you're doing is essentially moving the steering logic a little bit earlier, or doing it kind of speculatively earlier. Certainly, you can, uh, you can try to do that. Right. Yes? So the, so, the copy of this, uh, so the copy of the result in the cluster 1 is sent to, to the cluster 0 when, when the, uh, the next uh, instruction comes to the steering logic or when the steering logic, well, this is one implementation. When the steering logic sees an instruction that needs the result that's produced in this cluster, but that instruction is going to this other cluster. So, so in that sense, the error instruction is the tolerance because uh, when the instruction comes to the scheduler zero, it is not scheduled. That's right, it's not scheduled. There's an additional latency. So because this, this instruction now becomes dependent on this copy. Right. Yeah. It needs to wait for the result of this copy. Yeah. So 
also when the copy comes to uh, when the copy comes to this cluster zero, the uh, there is some other instruction in the scheduler, which is in a kind of the current instruction, which is this different. Uh, uh, say it again. I didn't understand that. Yeah, maybe I understand wrong. So I, I guess when uh, when the instruction comes to the scheduler zero, huh? there may be some other instruction also in the. So that's right. In the schedule, maybe. Yeah, and uh, so, so so that the, even the data, even the result of the cluster one comes to the cluster zero a little late, it doesn't. Uh, uh, harm the performance. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, certainly, certainly. Yeah. So it, it is certainly possible that this may not be on the critical path, right? Yes. There may be some other instruction chain that's on the critical path because it has long latencies. But that's true for every, every piece of code, I would argue. This definitely adds more instructions, though. It occupies more space in your scheduler. In that sense, it, has a performance, it could have a performance impact. That's right, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Because this instruction may not be on the critical path, right? Maybe there's a load instruction over here that's going to make you wait hundreds of cycles. Right. Okay. I don't know how we delved into this, but <laughs> this is good. Uh, let's see. Oh, that's not what I wanted. There should be a way. OK, there you go. This is better. OK. Oh, yeah. We, we came to it from, the, from your required readings, right? Alpha 21 to 64 microprocessor. So I would definitely do that reading very carefully. It's a, it has actually a lot of information about how, a, how an out of order processor operates. I guess that was due today. Today, right? How many people have done it? No one? <laughs> Are you guys doing the readings, other readings? <laughs> it's not? OK, good. I guess today, there's still a long time until the deadline, right? That's this early, uh, earliest deadline for scheduling. Or not scheduling anything right until the deadline. That's not a good scheduling strategy. The first one may be earliest deadline first, especially if you have many deadlines. But purely deadline-oriented scheduling is not that good. Uh, actually, this is the paper uh, that I was mentioning. So let me take a look at it. Maybe I'll highlight a couple of other things over here. Yeah, you, basically, I, OK, this is, yeah, this is the clustered part. Actually, Alpha 21 to 64 didn't cluster the issue queue. This is the scheduling logic, reservation stations. They decided not to cluster that part because their bottleneck was really the register file ports. They didn't have a bottleneck in terms of cycle time in the issue queue. So they, they wanted to do, mini, do the minimal thing to solve their bottleneck. So they clustered the execution units in the back end. Let's see what else. Actually, it does talk about branch prediction. And we'll have lectures on branch prediction, I think, in the last week of the class. But you should know it from 447. OK, I guess this should be fun. And there's, this is how they do the clustering, if you look at that. Clusters are actually asymmetric. Uh, they can all execute integer instructions. Uh, but some instructions, for example, integer multiply happens only in cluster 0, because they don't want to have multiple multipliers in the machine. But they all can execute four integer operations. Uh, well, each cluster can execute two integer operations, so you can have four integer operations per cycle total. Make sense? Yes? Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it doesn't necessarily help, right? Because ROB, then you're shifting the problem somewhere else. 
Now your reorder buffer has all of the registers. Plus, you need to have the architectural registers. In what sense? Like, why, why would you not need so many ports? When you're not accessing the same library. It's replicated. That's true, within the ROB. Yeah. That's right. But you still need to access the ROB. Yeah. So let's say you have eight instructions that are accessing, four instructions per cycle, and they all need to get their value from the reorder buffer. So you're back to the same problem. People have tried to reduce the contention on registers and register file and ROB a lot. There are a lot of ideas, actually. So one observation, I'll, I'll give you that one. People have made the observation that a lot of the values are actually communicated through the bypass paths. So you, you do an add, and the next add that you execute can capture that value from the bypass paths. If that's the case, you don't even need to access the register file. right? So if you can somehow figure that out, predict that, uh, then you can reduce the, port uh, reduce the port requirements on your register file in the common case. I think some of the numbers suggest that 60% of all, the, all of the register file reads are not necessary because the value comes from the bypass path, forwarding path. And there's a, there's a good paper to look at uh, for that. I'll just, it's a, it has a nice name. Lose loop sync chips. Oh, I guess that's not what I wanted. So this paper talks about some of those observations. I didn't assign this one. Uh, yeah, but I, I'll give you pictorially what I'm talking about. Basically. Uh, for most of the instructions, this forwarding loop supplies the data values. So you don't really need to, need to access the register file for those instructions because you're going to get the value from the forwarding logic anyway, from another execution unit, from another instruction that just executed. So they propose some mechanisms here. Uh, one mechanism, uh, one idea is actually you can cache some of these values that uh, are forwarded and you can increase the number of uh, you, can you can reduce the number of access to the register file even more. Because what they found out is the values that are just produced are more likely to be accessed than other values. So if you keep the values that are just produced somewhere closer, it's not, not in the register file, but somewhere over here, then you can access that structure much quickly and get those values quickly and reduce the number of ports on your register file. So you can take a look at this paper uh, if you want more detail. Actually, yeah, I think it's, it's this, but I don't distribute registry algorithm. Oh, maybe it's a cluster register cache. OK, anyway. <laughs> so people have tried to reduce the register file reads quite a bit. Okay, any, any other questions? I promise to keep it short, but we're going, <laughs> since we're going to have a review session uh, on Friday. Let me actually go uh, and quickly cover what else is coming. Uh, that's not what I wanted either. Okay. Yeah, hopefully you'll enjoy this reading today. Uh, and we'll finish out of order execution uh, today. Are you guys doing the lectures? Have you done the out of order execution lecture, for example? Not yet? Okay. Hopefully, you'll catch up because we have an exam Monday. Uh, and uh, the static instruction scheduling. So I have assigned the uh, super block paper for static instruction scheduling, so ho hopefully that should be fun. Uh, that's employed in all modern compilers that I know of today. Uh, and I've also assigned this other review, but we cannot find it here. 
Yeah, let's do the 27. This is the one that I was talking about. This is going to be a lower level paper. So there's a lot of analysis on circuit level complexity of superscalar processing. Uh, it's actually a fun paper to read. It analyzes the complexity of the register rename logic, uh, register file, uh, tag broadcast, the wake up logic, and other parts of the pipeline. And in the after, afterwards, it proposes this clustered microarchitecture, uh, which is basically what I discussed earlier. Right? You basically have a steering logic that steers the instructions, the different uh, schedulers. In this case, the schedulers are FIFOs. Basically, schedulers are in order, but across the schedulers, you can do out-of-order execution. Right? Whereas each of these FIFOs are in order. Once you steer an instruction, that goes into a queue. And it doesn't get scheduled based on its dependencies, but it gets scheduled based on what else is over here. It gets scheduled based on its dependencies at, at, uh, when it reaches the head of the queue. So the scheduling is out of order from the head of the queues, or heads of the queues. OK, remember, if you, if you remember the earlier parts of the lecture, I've actually shown this figure to you when we talked about why multicore, right? Now we're kind of circling back and covering some of those concepts. One of the alternatives to multicore was a clustered microarchitecture. Now you're going to do the readings on the clustered microarchitecture. OK. And next week, we're going to cover uh, some branch prediction. So you'll have some interesting readings on that, too. Any, any questions, thoughts? Yes. Oh, why coarse grain? So if you do coarse grain multi-threading, uh, the assumption is that uh, you have one execution context, one register uh, file, uh, one execution context executing, has the entire machine. Right? Now let's say you want to switch to another uh, thread. You would like to get rid of all of the instructions in the previous thread. That's why you need a pipeline flush. Does that make sense? Let me draw it. So the way I like thinking about, oh. let's see if this will work. Okay. The way I like thinking about uh, coarse grain multi-threading is this. You have program counter. Let's say you have two threads: program counter zero, program counter one. And they're feeding this fetch engine, and then decode, and then, I guess, register file access, let's say, and then dot, 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 right? At any given point in time, you either have instructions from this PC or the other PC in the machine. If, this is, if it's this PC, let's say, and after some point, this, P, uh, this, uh, this thread stalls, and you want to switch to the other one, you already fetched. Your pipeline is already full of instructions from this thread, let's say thread 0. Right. If you want to switch to the other one, you really need to get rid of all of the instructions. Otherwise, you cannot fetch from the other thread right, because the pipeline is full. That's why the switch requires a pipeline flush, yes? Yeah then, then you start, yeah, then you're moving to, from the spectrum of coarse grain to finer grain. That's right. You could design a machine that way. Then it becomes more like simultaneous multi-threading. So in the purest form, coarse grain, uh, you have this thread. If you want to switch to the other thread, and the thread has the entire machine to itself. If you want to switch to another thread, you flush the pipeline and set the PC set the thread selection logic such that it selects instructions from thread one. That's why you require pipeline flush. You can certainly optimize it the way you suggest, but now you'll have instructions from different threads at the same time in the pipeline. That's not coarse grain. That's a little bit finer grain. Okay. 
And the, the upside of this is, of course, now your pipeline is still single-threaded. It's not, you know that there's only one thread in your pipeline. So it's simple. You don't need to change much. The downside is when you need to switch, your overhead of switching is higher. Make sense? Yes? That's a, that's a good question. Uh, I guess it depends. I don't know what's the latest right now, but currently, uh, as far as uh, my latest knowledge, uh, they're like cores, as far as I know. Basically, the hardware exposed them as hardware contexts, and the operating system, let's say, sees four contexts per core. And it can schedule four things. But that's it. After that, those four things are managed by the hardware. That's right, exactly, exactly, yes. So it's, it's no different uh, from, uh, uh, from an SMP processor. Now the operating system, if it's aware of this, uh, like it, it could actually do scheduling optimizations, right? Symbiotic job scheduling, for example, is a proposal. Uh, when, when is that paper due? Have you read it? <laughs> you haven't, you're behind on papers. <laughs> So it's, I, I'll give you the basic idea, but you should do the reading. <laughs> Let me see. Uh, so it's, when was this? This is the 15th. <laughs> so this is one proposal to expose. So if, if, the, har if the hardware knows that two, uh, well, if the operating system knows uh, how many threads uh, can run on a particular processor. Actually, it is exposed today. Except it's not clear if the operating system take advantage of this. Uh, the operating system can put two threads that go nicely, that execute nicely together on the same processor. For example, if two threads are extremely compute intensive and they require the same resources, maybe you don't want them to be on the same hardware, uh, same uh, processor, right? same core. Maybe you want to put them into separate cores. Similarly, if two threads are going to thrash each other in the L1 cache, in an SMT processor, L1 cache is shared between different threads. And if the operating system somehow can figure this out, you may not want to put them on the same core again. You may want to separate them. And this has some heuristics, basically. You should read the paper uh, as to do that symbiotic scheduling. Basically, thre threads that have symbiosis with each other uh, should be scheduled together. That's the high-level key idea. Now, what exactly constitutes symbiosis? That really depends on what is being shared at the hardware level, uh, as well as the characteristics of the threads. What else? Yes. That's right. People actually uh, looked at that effect. Uh, it, it could be very bad. So uh, let me give you, actually, if we can start the multi threading lecture, but I'll give you an overview. We'll, we'll cover branch prediction in the next week. But usually what happens, well, there you go. That's better. Usually what happens is uh, the History tables, the pattern history tables are not replicated because those are the costly structures, right? So pattern history tables which store uh, basically the two-bit counters, for example. Uh, I'll call these the two-bit counters. These are, these are usually not replicated. 
Uh, but what is replicated is the return address stack. So you can have a return address stack for thread 0 and a return address st stack for thread 1. If you remember the power 4, power 5 slides from the lecture, they have these replicated return address stacks. Because this is actually critical, right? You don't want to take a prediction from some other thread's return address stack. So this is very, very critical. So they, they replicate the first order things. The other thing is the branch history register. Branch history register for thread 0 and branch history register for thread 1. Because correlation between branches uh, of different threads usually have, well, branches of different threads usually have nothing to do with each other. Right? Similarly as return at returns and calls. So you want to separate these. But then, and these are simple structures, simpler structures, because this is uh, an n-bit register, right? Actually, in alpha 21 to 64, how many bits is that? You guys remember? I think it was 10 bits. Was it 10? Or is it 12? Yes, let's, <laughs> let's take a look. Oh, we just had that open somewhere, right? Oh, there you go. I don't know if it has it in this one. Oh, there you go. It is. Oh, so it's 12 bits actually for the global branch predictor. So it's 4,096 entries by 2 bits each. Basically, the pattern history table is 4K entries, and each has 2 bits saturating counters saying which direction. Oh, OK, thanks. Yeah, it looks like this. It has 4K entries, and each uh, entry has 2 bit counters, which tells which what uh, saturating counters which tell the direction the branch went when you saw that history the last time. So this is usually not replicated, which means that now you can have aliasing between different threads, right? And that could be fortunate or unfortunate, meaning if, if the, uh, you can have positive interference in the sense that uh, these branches that are mapped to this counter may be behaving similarly, which is great. Or you can have negative interference. One of them should be taken and the other one should be not taken. And you keep mispredicting because they go opposite ways. So people have actually tried to exploit this for security purposes. There is a paper that looks at how to, how to cause these conflicts intentionally and how to measure the execution time of the application you're running together with by causing these conflicts such that you can predict what the other application is doing. It's, it's a statistical approach. It doesn't always work. But if you do the experiment enough times, yeah. yeah. I'm assuming maybe uh, there would be more accurate predictions if you just simply not take, the not, uh, take one of the threads and remove it from modifying the table oh. completely. So oh. you basically do this global prediction only on one of the threads. I see. What does the other thread do? No prediction? No prediction. Yeah. Is that yeah. guaranteed to be worse than, uh, so basically, is that worse than the negative interference? I see. So that's, uh, uh, empirically, that's usually much worse than the negative interference. Because if you don't do a prediction on that other thread, well, I guess you could do a prediction without these structures, right? Uh, but then your prediction accuracy goes down significantly. So the negative interference is a problem, but it's not a huge problem with the number of threads that we have today and the size of structures that we have today. That's why people have made that choice. But if you add 1,000 threads, then there could be a problem <laughs> sharing the structures. OK. So that's, uh, if, if your threads are all uh, doing the same thing, it could be actually beneficial to share the structures, you're right. Mm -hmm. yeah, that, that's actually a very, very good point. 
you could learn from if, if there's a phase shift between threads, one thread is executing ahead and the other is thread, thread is executing behind a little bit. But they're actually doing the same thing, seeing the same histories, taking the same branches. Then you could benefit from this kind of sharing. Yes? So uh, SMT is really the soul of SMT is about uh, the ability to schedule instruct, uh, instructions from different threads concurrently. So if you partition everything, you could still do that. Right? Well, you're kind of doing that with splitting two requests for a time being sort of Yeah, that's, uh, in, in SMT, it's really the space. Fine-grained multi-threading is scheduling instructions from different threads on a cycle-by-cycle -cycle basis, uh, but uh, not uh, instructions from different threads at the same time. Yeah. So it is still SMT, technically. But people have called it other things also. If you really partition everything, let's say, people call it clustered multi-threading, for example. You're really clustering the threads to different parts, and those parts are not interacting. So you could call it clustered multi-threading. <laughs> yes? Uh, within the pipeline, the execution pipeline, you have instructions from various threads executing different functions. That's the audience pipeline. So if uh, there's a misprediction, bad branch misprediction in one of the threads, do you flush everything or do you selectively flush? No, no, you selectively flush. Yes. It would be, the performance would be very bad if you flush everything. So you have a logic to selectively flush. I'm, I'm not talking about instructions, but the instructions that are already uh, in the pipeline. Uh, in the pipeline meaning in the execution units. Yes, yes you, you still selectively flush. So there are multiple ways of doing this. You don't necessarily need to have invalid bits, right? Uh, uh, I believe Pentium 4, uh, the way they did it was instead of having invalid bits in each register to enable this flush, uh, what they did was, uh, you c because whenever you have your signal a branch misprediction, you know the thread ID, and you know the uh, branch uh, sequence number of the branch. Right? Whenever an instruction completes, you compare its thread ID and the sequence number, and if the thread ID matches the mispredicted branch, and if the sequence number of the instruction is greater than the mispredicted branch, you basically drop the instruction on the floor. You don't update the register file. That's one way of flushing, right? You still ex you, it has some power cost because the instruction gets moved through the pipeline. And at the end of the pipeline, when it's about to write back its results somewhere, it gets dropped, invalidated. So the logic, it doesn't need to be that costly to do that flush. You don't need to send all of those flush signals everywhere in the pipeline. Uh, I count fetch policy. Basically, uh, I count, let's, I guess, open it in this case. The, the basic idea is fetch from the thread that has the fewest instructions in the pipeline. Why is that beneficial? The, uh, the, uh, the thought is that if a thread has lots of instructions, it's making slow progress, or maybe even stalled, maybe it's going to stall. You would like to fetch from those threads that are making fast progress, such that you most, most efficiently utilize your machine resources, your pipeline. So stall always comes from the Is it really what? Uh, so it's not, it's not really the length of the thread. It's really how many, uh, so, uh, uh, how many instructions are currently in the pipeline. The assumption is that if a thread has lots of instructions in the pipeline, its IPC is low because it's occupying a lot of resources and it's not making a lot of progress. That's the assumption. Whereas a thread that has few instructions in the pipeline, let's say one instruction uh, in, the, in the scheduler, uh, then likely the assumption is that, again, it's making a lot fast progress. It's not, 
it's not accumulating lots of instructions in the pipeline. So if you're optimizing, if your goal is to optimize for overall instruction throughput, instructions per cycle, icon policy makes the choice of prioritizing that thread that has fewer instructions. It's not necessarily the best policy as we've discussed, right? Because it perhaps prioritizes those threads that are already very fast. This is good for instruction throughput, but it may not be good for fairness, right? That other thread that is making slow progress now be becomes even slower. Yes, that's right. So it depends. Uh, it will if your reorder buffer is unified, right? And uh, people have targeted that problem. If you, you, you watch the multi-threading lectures, right? Not yet, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> so if, you're, if, in, 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 if, you're, if your machine is designed uh, such that reorder buffer is single and threads just share it, then one thread may cause another thread to stall. It becomes a little bit complicated to retire separately, but you can certainly design a machine that retires separately. I see. I see what you're saying. That's right. It's, it is less helpful in that case. You're right. And that's what people have found, actually. The icon policy is limited because if you have this uh, resource that's being shared, like reorder buffer, and if another thread is blocking it, it doesn't matter what you fetch that much. Right? If you look at the, well, you watch the lectures, right? Maybe. <laughs> He's thinking. <laughs> yeah. So that's one of the problems. That's one of the issues with ICON, because it doesn't take into account what's really stalling the pipeline in the back. And maybe it's too late by the time you fetch. Maybe a thread that's, that has lots of instruct, uh, a thread that uh, has been, uh, that is stalling for a long latency cache miss has already fetched a lot of instructions. Okay. Okay. So that's true even if, uh, that problem is true even if uh, your retire streams are separate between the threads because other things are shared, right? If a thread is already occupying all of your scheduler entries, for example, that's a problem. That's right, or MSHR entries, you're right. Or any entries because everything is shared, right? So if a thread that, uh, a thread that has a very long latency operation, usually it's problematic in SMT machines and people have tried to solve that problem. One idea, for example, that we discussed in lecture was when you get a long latency cache miss, flush the pipeline for that thread and let other threads continue. The upside is the other threads now can continue. The downside is you're really leaving a lot of performance on the table for that thread right, that you're flushing. And later in the lecture, we talked about run ahead execution, right? Actually, if you do run ahead execution in, in conjunction with SMT, that's a smooth way of handling these cache misses. And people have proposed that also. OK. Shall we call it a day? I said it was going to be short, but. <laughs> or any, any other questions? Burning questions? Yes. These expensive machines uh, that you were talking about, do they, uh, do any of them only do default detection or do all of them do this voting uh, to correct the fault? It just seems uh, unclear how useful is it to detect a fault on the execution unit and then flash an LED. Like if your satellite is in space, yeah, you can see the LED. <laughs> so are there any detection only? So that's a good question. It really depends on your application, as you said. In your satellite, you don't want an LED, perhaps. Although it's better than having nothing. 
<laughs> you, you do want to know if there's a fault, perhaps. Uh, yeah, you can reboot it. I guess. You can yeah, you can reboot it. That's right. There could be there could be faults that you can recover from. In that case, detecting is enough. Uh, but there are certainly machines that have been designed to do voting, uh, especially for those kind of applications, like safety critical applications. People have designed. Uh, triple modular redundancy machines where you have three processors they execute in tandem and they do voting at the end they still need to do lockstep execution to be able to do this but there are hard hardware cost increases do you know what it's actually doing in like federalized do they actually hmm. have three I don't know three replicas that's a that's a good question I, I have not actually I do not know what's used these days in the, in the past, uh, they had a very hardened technology. So they, even the technology is hardened such that these uh, are less vulnerable to faults to begin with. But my, my guess would be they would use some sort of voting because their, their cost is less of an issue. You have a lot more. Uh, your design point is such that safety is a lot more important. Right? Well, I guess it depends on what kind of satellite it is. but. <laughs> Yeah, maybe we should have a class on dependable computing. There is one, right? ECC, like coding? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Maybe you can come up with questions for their U session on Friday. We should put that up on the website too, that there's a review session on Friday. Okay. See you soon.